started in about 30 seconds. So uh, grab your coffee and grab a seat, and we'll begin in just a second. Well, friends, good morning, uh, and welcome here to First Presbyterian Church to our Sunday School Hour. My name is Ryan Bonfilio, and I serve here as the scholar in residence. And this morning, we have a special opportunity to hear from one of our TheoEd Talk speakers. TheoEd Talks is our speaker series, which, as you can tell, is coming up tonight. Hopefully, you all have bought your tickets and will be with us this evening. But the speaker we have with us this morning is Dr. Pete Enns. Uh, Pete uh, has, has his, uh, did undergrad at Messiah College in Pennsylvania and has his PhD. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, he has his PhD from Harvard University, where he studied, studied ancient Near Eastern languages and culture. Pete currently is the Abram S. Clemens. Did I get that right, Pete? Professor of Biblical Studies at Eastern University. And that should ring a bell because Eastern University is where Tony Sundermeyer, our head of staff, went to college. It's also where Shane Claiborne went to college, who was one of our speakers last year at TheoEd Talks. Uh, Pete is the author of numerous books from, such as The Sin of Certainty, The Bible Tells Me So, and The Evolution of Adam. When Pete's not teaching or uh, writing. Pete is co-hosting a popular podcast called The Bible for Normal People. If you haven't heard that podcast, I would highly recommend it. It's smart, it's funny, it's witty, and I think it claims to be the only God-ordained podcast out there. I think that might be true. I'm not sure how to confirm that, uh, but it's out there. <laughs> Pete, as you'll tell from this Sunday School lesson and from tonight, uh, is an incredibly engaging and thoughtful speaker and writer. I really see Pete as someone who's helping lay audiences come to better understand and relate to this, this strange and sacred book that we call scripture. Pete, in my mind, is exactly the sort of professor you want your 18 or 19 year old son or daughter to have when they go off to college because his ability to bring a faith perspective uh, but one that challenges uh, some stereotypes about scripture I think is just amazing and most importantly I should just add Pete lives in Lansdale Pennsylvania which as a point of trivia is also where I grew up Pete lives just a couple blocks down the street from where my parents had their arts and crafts store and Lansdale is also where uh, Tony Sundermeyer spent most of his childhood. So we've got this little uh, triumvirate from Lansdale here. It's really the only reason why we invited him uh, up on stage. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Pete. His Sunday school lesson is titled The Sin of Certainty, which is a topic he takes up in one of his books. So please join me in welcoming Pete Enns. Yeah, welcome to the Lansdale Mafia here. But uh, Anyway, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm blinded officially right now. I can't see anything, but anyway. Um, yeah, so it's, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Never been down to this church before, so this is a good opportunity, and it's sort of a nice place. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's really, really nice. Um, yeah, but I was asked to just to talk with you a little bit about, um, I, you know, the sin of certainty is rather a negative way. If, of course, that's the title of the book that I wrote, so that's my own fault, but um, about the reality of doubt in the life of faith. And usually when I ask this question, not enough people raise their hand, but has any of you, have any of you ever gone through periods of doubt in the life of faith? Most of you, right? And I don't mean just like, yeah, I'm not really sure, but I mean like it's dark, right? And where things just don't make sense. And, you know, that's a common thing that my college students deal with, but they're not allowed to tell anybody. You know, they can't tell their pastors, they can't tell their parents, they can't even tell themselves really. And, and to sort of help them think about this stuff and to help myself think about this stuff and to help, well pretty much, I mean most of you raise your hands, you know. If you've been a Christian for more than about 45 minutes, something happened, you know, that is gonna make you, that's gonna challenge how you think about the world and that's just my common experience. And, and I think it's a shame that the one place where you really should be able to talk about this is church, but that's oftentimes the last place you would ever dare utter something like that, because 
I see his heads nodding all over the place like bobbleheads right now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the, the place that's the most risky to be authentic about your faith. And I think that's a shame, but that's a common thing. And that's where people, you know, they start thinking they have doubts about something. And I was always taught or it was always modeled for me if I'm doubting there's something deeply wrong and flawed with me and I must not really be a Christian. And it's sort of not, that's not really true. That's, in fact, it's the opposite is the case. Doubt is a common part of the life of faith. In fact, you know, many people have said this much better than I have, but maybe you've heard it too. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. The opposite of faith is not doubt. Doubt is a part of the life of faith. I mean, the opposite of faith is certainty. I'm certain right now that I have a left arm. I'm absolutely sure. I don't need faith, right? That I, have a, I never doubt the fact that I have a left arm. It's sitting here, right? But faith is different. Faith engenders doubt because we're talking about things that, for the most part, we can't see. We experience them in certain ways, in spiritual ways and in community, but we can't, I can't prove things, right? And in a world that we live in, which likes evidence and proof, which are good things, by the way, for a lot of things, but when it comes to the life of faith, all of a sudden, that kind of way of thinking gets downloaded onto the life of faith. And when you stop being certain about God, like you're certain about your left arm, then everything starts falling apart. So, I mean, for, for my taste, you know, I think one thing that I, I'd like to talk about with, with uh, people is how normal it is to go through periods of doubt, and, and, and I mean serious doubt, like really dark night of the soul kinds of things where things just don't make sense. And part of that is just being an awake human being and living in the world that we live in. And for me, you know, what, one of the things that have always struck me is just things like how old the universe is, how big it is. I don't know, am I the only one here, but I look at that and I think to myself, that's the way from science, for example, that's a big thing for people. Science affects how they think about the world, and it does. Um, but you know, looking at the world and the universe and how big everything is and how old everything is, it, you know, the biblical world is very small. <laughs> you know, and things are more obvious and things are more apparent. And you know, there's this thing that's go. Go, Gobeki, or go, I always forget how to pronounce it, but it's a Turkish temple, Gobeki Tepe Temple. It's in Turkey. It was unearthed about 10, 15 years ago, and it's 11,000 years old. Now think about that. That's, my math says it's about 9,000 BC, right? And the time of Abraham is about 2,000 BC. So this is 7,000 years older than Abraham, people were worshiping something. It relativizes the biblical story a bit, doesn't it? You know, when there's evidence of people making some sort of boats to get from one island to another, that's 100,000 years ago. I, I think to myself, what were they like? What, what were they, they were people, right? How much like me were they? And all this Jesus stuff comes much later. I mean, like way later. If you took all of the time of the universe, which is whatever, 13.8, 14 billion years, right? I saw this on Cosmos. You, ever, you watched Cosmos a couple of years ago with Neil deGrasse Tyson? If you took all of that and put it on a 12-month scale, where do human beings show up? Well, not June or July or August or September or October or November, not until... December 31st at 10.24 p.m. That's when human-like things start showing up. Israel comes onto the world stage at 11.59 and 53 seconds, seven seconds before midnight. Jesus shows up two seconds later. And all of our sorry little lives can be encapsulated in about the last tenth of a second and I think about that stuff, maybe too much, but that's the thing that does it to me, right? Or, I'm not asking for this, right? It just sort of happens. 
because I'm awake and I'm just, I learn things. And, and um, I meet people who are different than me, you know, because the world is shrinking. And, you know, how does all this work? <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's, it's nice when the universe is small and you have your tribe which is a lot of the biblical language is around a tribe and a small part of the world, but when it's like this, you know, what, what, how can you not question things now and then, right? How can you not question things? So it's normal, and, and when, especially students, especially first-year students, they realize the Bible and all that stuff, it's more than veggie tales, it's more than youth group. It's actually adult literature, and they have to think through it, and there are these gaps and things that just, it's a weird book, right? And they have this crisis of faith, and they say, I just don't know if I believe this stuff anymore. And I just said, well, welcome to Christianity. Welcome to adult Christianity. This is, this is what happens. This is normal. What I don't tell them is that they were set up for the fall to begin with by being taught a simplistic way of thinking about the faith. But it's a normal thing, and, and that, that can sort of help people, I think. It releases a lot of tension for them to think that they're somehow broken because they're thinking. And what if God understands? What if God understands that we can't help when and where we were born and what influences we've had in our lives? So it's, it's normal, you know? I, I mean, have you ever, like, read a book... Of course you have. Um, or, I don't know, watched a movie and you really, really liked it. <laughs> and you identify with the characters, right? And it's not a Christian movie. It's not a Christian book. It's just a story, like you know, Lord of the Rings or pick whatever you want, where you just, you imagine yourself as part of that world. With the characters or with what's happening but again, it's not remotely something that we would call Christian or biblical. And you say to yourself, I could be very happy in that world, never having heard of God or Jesus or anything else. Right? I mean, this is just, just reading or watching movies can put you in a different place. It doesn't have to, but for a lot of people it can. It's just being awake and aware. So, you know, I think it's normal. I also think, so here's, to me, the big thing is this. I think that dealing with, with these periods of doubt is actually a very biblical idea. It's not just something we're imposing onto the text. I think it's really there more often than we'd like to think. I remember um, when my daughter, my youngest is now 25, when she was 16 years old in high school, and I know parents here, you can sort of... Uh, You'll get this, but I was amazed. When she was 16, she did not worship the ground that I walked on. Whatever. Okay, so, you know, and she's just being a 16-year-old, if you know what I mean. Just no disrespect. But, like, she wouldn't friend me on Facebook. And then she did. And then she unfriended me on Facebook. And I don't know why. And then she was just really just nasty. And she was really mean, you know. So, I mean, one day, after, this is going on for months, and I, I went, uh, we, were, we happened to sort of meet as we came out of our respective bedrooms, and I just, said, I just stopped her and said, Sophie, what's going on here? You know, what, what's happening? And she just stood there for a second, looked at me, and she goes, if I can just reproduce a 16-year-old pose like this, but she looked at me, and she said, I just don't like you, and then walked down the steps, <laughs> Right? So I'm like, I'm a failure as a human being, like my kid hates me and what did I do wrong and all that kind of stuff. But I talked about this, I just happened to mention to someone who was in a later stage of life, had raised children, and I told him what happened, he said, good for you. I said, what do you mean good for me? And he goes, you have to understand, she trusts you enough to be honest with you like that. She trusts you enough to tell you what she actually thinks. <clears throat> so good job teaching your child to be honest. And I'm like, okay, you know, I went from the worst father ever to father of the year in about two minutes. So that was a good feeling. But see, it strikes me that the Bible has many of these moments as well. And I think that's a really good thing, that sort of baked into the pages of the Bible, you have people being very, very honest about, I don't like God right now. You know, I mean, Psalm 44, is it? 
it's, you know, this, the, the psalmist, uh, the psalms are great for this, by the way. This is why you've got to read psalms. He goes on and on about, oh, in the days of old, you were great. You always showed up to rescue your people, and you gave them what they needed. Those, boy, those were the days. They were fantastic. I can't, those were great days. And then you get toward the end of the psalm, and you finally get to his point. He goes, when are you going to wake up? Awake, O oh Lord. It sounds very pious when you put it that way, but it's when are you going to wake up? Because we got a problem. We need your help, and you're a no-show. Or Psalm 88, which is just the psalm that is, it's like, how did this get in here? I think to myself sometimes. But Psalm 88 is all about my life. I toss and turn. I can't, I can't sleep. Everyone has abandoned me. My friends have abandoned me. I'm all alone. God, it's your fault that this happened. And the psalm ends with, and darkness is my only friend. Period. Next psalm. Like, no, like, and here's the happy ending. There is no happy ending to that. Now, there are 150 psalms granted, right? But you get these things that make their way in. And I'm always amazed by that because, you know, we, scholarship knows that the book of psalms didn't just plop out of the sky or something. It was edited. It was collected. And probably even around the time of Jesus, there was some fluidity in what psalms were included in this book that we call the Psalter. The point is that decisions were being made about what to keep and what not to keep. And you have these dark psalms, these lament psalms, that they made the cut. They made the cut because they actually reflect something of what authentic faith looks like for these ancient Israelites. Now, I think that's one reason why the Old Testament is important for Christian faith. One reason is that you have psalms like this that are in there, not to mention Job or Ecclesiastes or the Book of Lamentations. There's a lot of sadness in the Old Testament, right? But I think one reason why we need that and we need to embrace that is because the New Testament doesn't really talk like that, right? It's not woe is me stuff. It's pretty triumphal, right? Jesus came, Jesus is raised, here are the implications and all that sort of stuff. Written over maybe a few decades. With the, I don't know if this is going to be controversial or helpful at all, but written under the assumption that it's not going to be much longer before all this turns around and Jesus reigns on earth and all this, in other words, second coming kind of language. That's, you read the New Testament, it's pretty obvious. Paul thought it's not going to be long. Don't get married. <laughs> you know, if you have to, go ahead, but don't, it's like, just not enough time. You know, how could you possibly do that? Um, but I just, I find that fascinating that, you know, in, um, you know, this, this short period of time that takes up the New Testament, well, compared to the old, like, the writings of the Old Testament span, most people will say, about 1,000 years. The writings, like the earliest texts are maybe around 1200 BC. The latest texts are probably maybe 200-ish around there, second century. Plenty of time to have a faith crisis. <laughs> Plenty of time for something to go wrong, right? And that's why the witness of the Old Testament is the reality of people living in God's world, but for the long haul. Right? There's nothing in the New Testament that says, by the way, you're probably still going to be reading this in 2,000 years. So, you know, listen up, and here's how you deal with that stuff. There's, you don't really have that. You have the time is short. In the Old Testament, you have the time is long. And that's where people can deal with, like, why does it seem like God is not showing up? Why does it seem like God is not with us. Why does it... I'm doing everything I can to believe right. You know, like Psalm 73. Um, in vain, I've kept my faith because I'm plagued with ills all day long. But the arrogant, they have everything they want. Right? That's not the way the world's supposed to work. So he's dealing with the fact that I understand what the template should be, but I don't see it in my life, actually. That's largely what the book of Job is about. That's largely what the book of Ecclesiastes is about. You don't have a book of Job in the New Testament. You don't have a book of Ecclesiastes in the New Testament. You don't have lament psalms in the New Testament. 
it's a different time, it's a different moment, it's the climax, it's the ending of something big. That's why we need Psalms. We need Psalms like Psalm 89, which is one of my favorite Psalms. And it's, it's a long one, and it's really redundant, and that's sort of the point. Right? Psalm 89 goes something like this. Oh Lord, you're awesome. We can't believe how awesome you are. Here's why you're awesome. First of all, you never lie. You are always steadfast to your people, and you always take care, and when you say something, it's going to happen. You're, you're just the best. Also, we'd like to add to that that you're the almighty creator. You've created everything there is. So you're so powerful that you can do anything you want to do, and you're a promise keeper, so we can count on you no matter what. Have we mentioned lightly that you're awesome, and you're strong and powerful, and you're a promise keeper, and, and you've created everything, and it's just amazing. Oh, and you know what? You know what like, your best promise was? It was to David. Here's your best promise. It was to David. Um, you promised David that no matter what, one of his descendants would always be sitting on the throne. That's 2 Samuel chapter 7. So what that was... Let me tell you, that was a great promise. Thanks for making that. was fantastic. By the way, you're almighty, and you're the creator, and you keep promises, and whatever you want to do, you can do. So thanks again for the promise to David. Oh, Lord, could we talk about the exile for a moment? Right? When you get to the end of the kingdom of Judah, the north has been gone for a hundred and something years. The kingdom of the south is there. And the last king of Judah <clears throat> is taken cap blinded and taken captive to Babylon. But not before his three sons are killed right in front of him. Thus, in effect, ending the Davidic dynasty. Talk about a faith crisis in the Old Testament. It's like, this was a sure promise. I mean, just think about this. And they didn't cut this out of the Bible. They could have, right? They could have. Humanly speaking, they, could have, they edited this thing very intelligently, very thoughtfully. Actually, all these bummer psalms are in the middle of the, of the book. They start with life is very simple. You know, Psalm 1, um, there are two kinds of people, those who meditate on the law and those who don't. One makes you wicked, one makes you righteous, right? It's like a very black and white world. Then you get to the middle where everything falls apart, <laughs> like Psalm 89, 88, and that stuff. And then as you move on, as the psalms end, it becomes more praise to God, but not in a simplistic kind of tit-for-tat kind of way. Right? I mean, the Psalms are actually orchestrated, they're set up, but they make you pass through that dark period where there's no obvious resolution. And again, I can't just, I can't get enough of that. You know, I mean, that, see, that speaks to people who are going through this reality of doubt. You actually have things in the Bible you can relate to. Right? It's not all Find that psalm that praises God and read it 50 times. Maybe you need to find Psalm 88 or 89 that says, I get it. Identify with it. That, that is an emotion. Because it is. It's an emotion of despair and of fear and of sadness. That is an emotion that is canonized, quite literally. Part of our tradition. It's there for a reason. And I think in God's providence, God knows we're people. And we experience these things, and it's a normal part of faith. And I think it's a shame that, especially, I keep thinking of young people, because that's sort of my life right now, but how young people are taught in church, that's actually a sign that you're outside of God's umbrella and outside of God's favor. And I just say, you've got to read the Bible with me. It's just right there. So, you know, it's, it's normal, and it's also, it's quite biblical. And also... I think doubt does something that is very, very beneficial. It does something that most other things can't do, which is basically press reset. I mean, in my own experience, you know, I, I've gone through periods, you know, whatever, sometimes lasting a long time, sometimes not as long, but I think of someone like Mother Teresa who had what they call the dark night of the soul for 47 years which is interesting. <laughs> Mother Teresa, like holy roller. Actually, there's this great story. I tell the story in The Sin of Certainty where um, John Cavanaugh, 
who was, he just died within the last two or three years. He was a moral philosopher, a Roman Catholic theologian, who in the mid-70s was going through his own personal crisis of meaning and of faith, and good for him for admitting it, first of all. A lot of professors don't want to talk about that because they have to look like they have their act together for everybody else, but, or pastors too, right? But so he decided, listen, I'm going to take some time off. I'm going to go to Calcutta and meet Mother Teresa. She'll fix it because she's awesome, right? So he shows up, and he meets her, and she says, what can I do for you? And he says, you can pray for me. And she goes, well, what can I pray for? And he said, pray that I have clarity. And she said, no, I will not do that. And he's like, why, you little kicker? Um, no, I will not do that. And he says, well, why? That's sort of why I'm here. And she said, because, th and this is the thing, I remember reading this first time on the internet years and years ago, and this, this line hit me just right between the eyes. She said, I will not pray for that. He said, why? And she said, because clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. Do you hear that? I, I'm like, I, I was reading that and saying, I've been doing it wrong. And it just hit me as being so true that maybe what you're clinging to is this need to know and to understand and to be certain. Clarity. And that's not what you have. So he said to her, I said, well, you seem to have tons of clarity, lady. I didn't say lady, but I'm saying it. Um, and she laughed. And she said, I haven't had clarity a day in my life. But what I've had is trust. And so I will pray that you trust God. And I had never in my mind thought of like separating the two, you know, like clarity and trust. I thought, how can you have trust if you don't have clarity? But she just sort of blew that away from me completely. Because sometimes, well, not sometimes, you know, we entertain thoughts of God that work. But after a while, we think of God as actually those things that we think. You know the old saying that God created man in his own image, and we've been returning the favor ever since? That's either Mark Twain or Rousseau, depending on what website you look at. But anyway, or probably Homer Simpson. I don't know who said it. But, um, but it's the truth. You know, it's like we, we, we are only human. We cannot help but think about God in terms of how we think about anything, right? We, we are, all our language of God is really rooted in our experience, which is why, you know, in the Bible, you have metaphors, right? Like God is a potter, God's a vine dresser, God's a farmer, God's a warrior, God's a king, right? Pick your metaphor. Those are taken from the ancient world. I think God's fine with that, right? You have these metaphors, you have ways of talking about God, because we're not up there looking down on God, we're just people experiencing things, right? So we, we have this metaphorical language of God that's inescapable, but sometimes what happens is we get trapped into that way of thinking, whereas, well, I've got the God thing pretty much figured out now. I know what God's like, you know, I've studied this stuff, I've read it, whatnot. And maybe God is bigger than we can possibly imagine. What if there's more to God than we can just control with our experiences and our minds? So every once in a while, this is how some people think about it, and this makes a lot of sense to me. Every once in a while, you get to have a faith crisis, which is basically pushing reset. And no, you don't understand. I feel like God's not there at all. Yeah, exactly. Your God's not there anymore, and maybe it's time to learn a different way of thinking about God because maybe you're ready for it. See, the irony is that in a, in a crisis moment of faith, when you're doubting, people like St. John of the Cross or Teresa of Avila, these medieval you know, uh, mystics of the Roman Catholic Church, they say things like, that's exactly when you're closest to God, you just don't know it. Because God is very present with you in his absence. How's that for a paradox, right? Like, what if, God's, what if God is not abandoning you what if your idea of God isn't working anymore and this is a way to get used to it and start building things up again? You know, I mean, 
I don't know if any of you have had that experience. I've had it. You know, I think most people have had it at some point. I remember sitting there once years ago, and nothing made sense anymore. I just everything I thought about God just made no sense to me. And I remember just sitting on my couch and thinking to myself, I'll never go to church again. I'll never. What am I going to do at Christmas time? <laughs> all my ideas of that, that where God is clustered around things, they were all like evaporating to me. I was mourning. It was a difficult time. But, and I can't even explain how this happened, but just over a period of many, many months and maybe even a year or two, I just began sensing God differently in ways that people who had not gone through a period like that might not immediately appreciate. Or, this sounds really bad. I don't mean understand like they're dumb. It's just it's not something people haven't experienced yet. But there it is. And I sense God more as, more as spirit than I had before, not somebody up in the sky who does things. Right? But I needed that. I mean, not everybody goes through things like that. Again, I think most of you probably have, but, um, but I'm thankful for it. I'm glad that I've had the rug pulled out from under me more than once in my life. I don't like it then. I don't like picking myself up off the floor, but heck, you know, it's better than living in a fantasy or living in a fog where the God you worship is actually just a bigger version of yourself, right? And so I think that's, that's the thing about doubt it's not something you, you like, I can't wait to be doubting. Like, that, that's not it. It's like, it's, it'll come. <laughs> Just leave it alone. It'll get there. But it's more like when it's there, it, it may be this, this moment that is absolutely needed. I, I think of this analogy of taking a hike and getting to an opening of a cave, and there are railroad tracks there. And there's a little one of those mining cars, right? And it's like on the precipice, just sort of sitting there, and I'm stupid enough to get into it. And before I know it, it's rolling. And before I know it, it's going whoosh, like a roller coaster. It's going down. And the downer it goes, the darker it gets. And it feels like it goes on forever, and then it just sort of stops. And it's absolutely pitch black. You have no idea how far, a mile, two miles, whatever it is. And you sit there. And maybe you climb out and you start, <laughs> like, how do I get out of here? Right. Oh, Lord, get me out of here. Nope. Oh, Lord, how about a flashlight? No flashlight for you, right? You, you just want to get back that sense of control over your environment, over your life, over things. But you have to learn that you, at, at the end of the day, you actually have no control. Control is a myth. Control is a fantasy that we like to put on our lives. And every once in a while, I think we, will, we try to control God as well. I shouldn't speak for everyone, but it's a common thing. I know I've experienced this. We try to control God. Think about that. We know what books God likes. We know what movies he likes. We know what people he likes. We know everything about God. And half this is sort of coincide with what we like, too. And sometimes we need that darkness where all that is taken away and our self-confidence about what God is like. And those are harsh moments, but those are also tender moments. So I think, you know, doubt does something for us that other things really can't do. Now, Pete, you don't understand, I am really, really deep down <laughs> in all sorts of struggles with my faith and doubting and this and that. You don't understand. No, I, I understand it's black. You just, it's, it's just utter sightlessness and darkness, and you just don't know really what the next step Your life's not predictable anymore. You don't know what the next step is. But God is really completely absent. There's no God. Yeah, maybe that's how God is present at this point, right? T taking away those ideas that we have of God. So I don't think we should, you know, romanticize the reality of doubt. Like, it's not, it's not like sexy or trendy. You know, and I hear this too, a very cavalier way of talking about this deep pain of doubt when people say, yeah, I'm just doubting stuff. I don't really believe anything right now. That's just immature. That's not doubt. That's cocky. 
That's immaturity, and that's fine. We've all been there in some sense, right? And that's, God will take care of that too. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really deep down where it really matters that it does something. It does something positive. It's not to be sought after. It will come in its own time <laughs> when we least expect it. Maybe when everything's going well, right? Sort of like Job, right? When you've got everything and then nothing. But it's, it's normal. It's really biblical. Not on every page, but in sections of the Bible. That stuff's there. And it's actually ultimately beneficial for us. So I'm thankful for those periods for myself. You know. what would I, I, I think to myself, what would I be, what kind of a jerk would I be right now if I had kept going thinking that I'm master of this universe because I did all this schooling stuff to think about God? You know? What if I hadn't learned better how to listen to other people? You know, I mean, I think one thing that these periods of, of, of doubt and, and, and sorrow and mourning and, and the relativizing of your own faith, I think one thing that does is it gives you maybe a bigger heart for other people to try to listen and understand where they're coming from and not always to have the answer about what God is like. Again, I keep thinking about that, what God is like. <laughs> you know, that's like the thing we feel we have this handle on. I can't imagine that. Um, we have a few minutes here, and here's what I'd like to do. Everybody hold hands. Just kidding. You're Presbyterian. I would never... I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. Don't, talk, don't turn to the person next to you and say anything. Don't do that. But I just... If, you know, if any of you have your own moments of, of struggling with this, and if you have any interest in just saying, yeah, I did too, and sort of here's what's happening, and I only say that because I can sit up here and talk, but you all sort of go to church together. And it might be nice just to say, yeah, I, I, I passed through that. And I think just to be an encouragement to each other. So anybody want to be bold? Again, I know the Presbyterian world very, very well. I know I'm asking a lot of you <laughs> to be warm human beings. I know this is hard. I, Episcopalians are just as bad as you are. That's where I go to church, so it just never works there. But how, how many of you can... Uh, just, again, hands. How many of you can really relate to this dark night of the soul? Where just nothing makes sense, you know? And not to prejudice, but many of you who are, are, are older, which makes sense, because you have to have lived, right? You have to have understood and, and experienced things. Like a 20-year-old really doesn't have a, a dark night of the soul. Right? I just... You, you don't have the right. <laughs> you know, not enough has happened. You haven't raised kids yet. So don't even talk to me about dark night of the soul, right? So, yeah. Does anybody want to just relate something here just briefly, just what it was about? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we could do that too. Good Presbyterian. I don't want to talk. I want to ask you a question. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think you have to be careful about that because, <clears throat> first, I don't think those two things are necessarily unrelated, right? But there's, see, I, I think it, in the dark night, I think you do feel depressed. The question is whether it's clinical depression, right? And that's why being wise about, you know, the signs of clinical depression, which are more pervasive, right, and not just at a moment like that, you know? I mean, I, I can say that I was probably... <clears throat> I was probably depressed for about six months. And I did talk to people about that, about that fact. And I think I needed to do that. But my personality is not a depressive personality. So I understood myself well enough that I could sort of put those pieces together. I think you have to really know yourself, right? But, but you're right, you know. And um, people are just wired differently, I think so. Yeah, I appreciate that, yeah. Perhaps, yeah, uh, although for some, I mean, they don't see any hope, and they can't conjure it up themselves, and if they're told, you need to have hope, it's like, you don't understand, right? Um, it's like telling somebody who's clinically depressed, 
just be happy. You know, it doesn't really work that way, right? But that's why I think having, a, this is why church is important, folks, having a community around you who gets it, who's not trying to fix you, who just lets you be you, and so, you know, sit this one out. We'll believe for you, right? That's, I think that's, that's, what's, that's as important as anything. Perhaps so. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, the Bible for normal people. What's a normal person? Somebody who doesn't like, didn't go to seminary or major in Bible in college or anything like that. Just people who are like really interested in what scholars say, but don't ever want to go to school for that. And I don't blame you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Like, where's God when you need him? Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. And that's why, you know, people have talked about the, you know, the problem of evil, of God is almighty and loving, all that kind of stuff. That's a real problem. And that's very, very old. That's older than the biblical tradition. The Babylonians talked about that. Like, it's like you never escape that particular problem. And don't look at me for an answer to that one. I mean, the only thing that I can think of that's not an answer, but it's like, hmm, it's how, to my knowledge, Christianity, in all its forms, but Christianity is the only faith where God somehow enters into suffering and participates in it. And that's a weird thing, if you think about it for a second. Like, however you understand Jesus and incarnation, all that kind of stuff, God's man is suffering and God enters into human suffering somehow. That's not an answer. But that's like an interesting factor for Christians to sort of throw into the mix there. How does, you know, why are half the Psalms about suffering, you know? But, you know, I, like tsunamis, all that kind of stuff. You know, I just, the island's getting wiped out. Oh, well, you know, what, what, how can you speak of God the way? But yeah, absolutely. So thank you for creating tremendous doubt for the people behind you. <laughs> But, you know, the thing is, uh, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to think about it because something might happen. I think integrity is an important thing here because once you have an idea like that, it's like you can't just make believe you don't have it anymore. So what are you going to do? You just have to say, I need to sit with this like people have been doing for literally thousands of years. I'm not the first one to think of it. And maybe some type of answer or peace will come from that. Admitting to yourself that you, you're struggling or doubting is sometimes the biggest thing, so yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I, and I, the thing is, you know, it's, again, it's how to work through these things. That sounds very mechanical, but it might not just be thinking more or thinking less. And so I, um, one of my professors, John Levinson, I don't know if that name rings a bell to anybody, but uh, he's one of my J Jewish professors. He wrote a book called, a couple years ago called The Love of God. And Judaism, just like some aspects of Christianity, they have this thing down very well, which is called liturgy, right? And one of the purposes of liturgy, of reciting things on a weekly basis, of having these just baked into your head, is that the practice can continue even if the thinking doesn't. And the practice then helps you. It's not like our brains are like running the show anyway. You know that? I mean, I don't know much about neuroscience, but I know enough to know that our thoughts are not prominent. Our thoughts follow our emotions and our feelings. And if you, that's a hard thing to hear, but it's true. You know, it's like we don't think of it first. We experience and emote, and then our brains come along for the ride to justify what we're thinking, right? That flips the whole modern world around, sort of. But, but it's, it's, it's the practice of Judaism. Judaism is a practice. Well, the thing about for most of the history of the church, Christianity has been a practice, not a list of things you believe, right? And so that practice can continue, and, and, and 
work in you, right, and, and to affect you. I've experienced that too with, with hymns or just songs like on Christian radio of all things I listened to in the 70s. Back when Christian music was pretty good, by the way, I got to say that. Matthew Ward, Keith Green, Larry Norman, anyway. Um, but, you know, things like that, it's just like, it, it, it takes me back, it reminds me, right? So you need reminders sometimes of where you've been, and this is not the rest of your life, life here. It's just the moment that you're in, and to remember your whole story, and, and you don't know where it's going to go, right? And something other than thinking will do that. That's a, that's a, I'm glad you asked, so that's a really good point. So. Yeah. Okay. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, I, mean, I appreciate you saying that, and another word that came to my mind as you were saying that is a, a deeper faith, which is one metaphor. Another one, which is a little bit scary for Christians to say, but I think there's something to it. It's almost like an awakening and, in, and being enlightened to a bigger God and a bigger world that we live in. Not by minimizing the pain, but something about that just it brings you to a different place. And, and you're thankful for it in a way, even though you wish these things had never happened. But still, you know, you're... I, mean, I, I resonate with that. I'm, not where I was, I'm glad I'm not where I was 20 years ago. I, I'm a disaster now as a husband and father. I'd be worse you know, <laughs> if I had left alone, but... Anyway, Ryan, do, it's, do we have time for one more? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there are a lot of reasons for that, and it depends on the tradition that you're in, but... Um, I know that's a common experience of students at Eastern, and like we're teaching them things that are just sort of like normal Bible stuff almost, and it's blowing them out of the water. Like, don't take the book of Revelation literally, stuff like that, you know, and here's why. And a student just asked me in class, why did my church do this to me? And I said, because I, you can say this stuff at Eastern University, I'm glad for that for the kids' sake, I said, because your church was probably more concerned with making you a good citizen of the church rather than being curious and exploring your faith. And I think that's rooted in fear. And I think there are elements of, of fundamentalism and forms of evangelicalism where that fear is dominant because it's all about keeping you within a tribe, quite literally a tribe. And I, I think God's bigger than that, right? But that's, that's how they're taught to think. My whole life, I have heard this, that, and the other thing. I'm now reading this Bible and this story for the first time carefully. I can see all that's just nonsense. It just doesn't work. That's the experience students have. I, don't, I mean, I can go on and on. I think a lot of it comes down to things like biblical inerrancy, too, and a biblicism in a way that the Bible functions as almost like a rule book for us, and it's perfectly consistent, and there are no questions to be asked of it, right? So. And speaking as a parent, I do think that, like, the big thing is fear, because we're afraid our kids are going to go to hell when they die if they don't believe all the right things, so you indoctrinate them very early. How, how do you raise kids in the faith that's not almost a mind control indoctrination? That's not an easy question to answer, I think. 
All righty, I guess we need to stop then, right? Thank you very much, folks. Yep. Next week, yeah.